You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. My son was in the Army back during Desert Storm, but even then he wanted an MBA. He looked at a dozen schools, but only one offered the online education and flexibility he needed while he was in a tent in Iraq. Grantham University. Turns out that Grantham's been delivering affordable, relevant college and advanced degrees for over 65 years. Heck, if they can deliver a quality education to a soldier in a tent overseas, think about the flexibility Grantham can offer you so you can earn your degree too. It doesn't matter how complicated or full your life is. If getting a degree is on your bucket list, you'll want to do what my son did. You'll want to call Grantham. Find out how easy it is to get started on your education so you can check that college degree off your bucket list. Call Grantham right now. 800-910-1370. That's 800-910-1370. Flexible. Affordable. Relevant. Call 800-910-1370. Tired of paying outrageous prices for Viagra? Well, we have great news for you. Now you can finally get Viagra at huge discounts. Healthy Man allows you to save up to $500 on Viagra. Why pay U.S. pharmacy prices of $15 per pill or more when you can get Viagra for less than $3 a pill? Call today and get 40 Viagra pills for only $99. This can cost as much as $600 at your local pharmacy. You can't afford not to call us. If you want Viagra at the lowest prices, never pay $15 of pill pharmacy prices again. Get Viagra for less than $3 a pill. Call 1-800-516-7602 today and save up to $500 and get 40 pills for just $99. Healthy Man is fast, easy, and affordable. Operators are waiting at 1-800-516-7602 to take your call right now. Call 1-800-516-7602. That's 1-800-516-7602. Again, 1-800-516-7602. Attention business owners and independent contractors. This is a money-saving message from Tax Mediation Services. If your business owes $20,000 or more in taxes, we can help you today, right now. Listen, dealing with the IRS is no picnic. It's an intimidating and extremely stressful process, and you don't want to go it alone. Our attorneys know every law, every tax break, and every possible opportunity to help you resolve and reduce your tax debt. And if you owe more than $20,000, you may be at the top of their hit list. So don't take your tax debt lightly because it will not go away on its own. The IRS can seize your bank accounts, your home, and even shut down your business. Call our tax experts today at 1-800-783-0810 and let us deal with the IRS while you focus on your business. That's 1-800-783-0810. Again, that's 800-783-0810. Tired of paying outrageous prices for Viagra? Well, we have great news for you. Now you can finally get Viagra at huge discounts. Healthy Man allows you to save up to $500 on Viagra. Why pay U.S. pharmacy prices of $15 per pill or more when you can get Viagra for less than $3 a pill? Call today and get 40 Viagra pills for only $99. This can cost as much as $600 at your local pharmacy. You can't afford not to call us. If you want Viagra at the lowest prices, never pay $15 a pill pharmacy prices again. Get Viagra for less than $3 a pill. Call 1-800-516-7602 today and save up to $500 and get 40 pills for just $99. Healthy Man is fast, easy, and affordable. Operators are waiting at 1-800-516-7602 to take your call right now. Call 1-800-516-7602. That's 1-800-516-7602. Again, 1-800-516-7602. Oh, 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 O'Reilly. This is Derek's O'Reilly Auto Parts story. After the third time jump starting my car, I finally realized my battery was dying. So I stopped by O'Reilly to have it checked. They tested it right there in the parking lot. It was bad, real bad. But they helped me find the right battery for my car and even installed it for free. Now my car starts like new. Oh, 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 O'Reilly. Auto Parts. The following program contains coarse language and adult themes. Listener discretion is advised.
welcome everyone to another episode of the Cocktail Lounge. I am your hostess with the mostest, Aggie, and with me as always is the ever suave, affable, and quaffable co-host of mine, Brad Slager. How are you doing today? <laughs> we are doing fine. We're doing fine. I'm just uh, doing the usual, watching our media complex just completely unravel before our eyes, and it's hilarious and glorious. It has been quite, quite a, quite a show. I, I have, I have to say, I am kind of aggrieved that it's still Lent because popcorn is not on the list of things for me to chew uh, on. True, true. You're still denying yourself even that. Wow. Yes, yes, I am. One more week. One more week. Come, <laughs> come Sunday, it's all over, people. <laughs> But it has been rather uh, interesting to see people absolutely lose their ever-loving minds over Rona McDaniel going to NBC. Um, I mean, over, oh, there's just so many things that journalists have been, like, completely going apeshit over. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this one in particular has been amusing because they're... I think at some point in time, they've caught themselves a little bit, but not entirely, (laughs) because basically what we saw take place was a lot of teeth gnashing, hair pulling, pearl clutching. How can you do this? How can you have a Republican committee chairperson on the air, says everybody at MSNBC who used to work for the Democrats. Chuck Todd, Jen Psaki, Simone Sanders, Claire McCaskill, who was a Democrat senator, on and on. And they're all bitching and moaning. It's okay for them to be former Democrat operatives. But we can't have a former Republican operative on. That's just out of control. And then on top of that, it, you know, they, they kind of justify their outrage by, oh, well, because of lies, because of the election denialism. That's what this is really all about. We have integrity at MSNBC. Really now? Mm-hmm. But this was what cracked me up even more. Like, it, it's, on Meet the Press, Chuck Todd had just an absolute emotional break, it looked like. <laughs> <laughs> it was rather funny. I mean, he actually said the words, Rona McDaniel has a real problem with integrity. Chuck, Todd said this. Yeah, I'm, what? Who used to not only work for a Democrat, but his wife started her own Democratic Party consulting firm, pocketed about $1.5 million from the Bernie Sanders campaign, for instance, held fundraisers for Democrats inside their home. Chuck Todd is the landlord of Amy Klobuchar. Okay. (laughs) At no point in time has Chuck Todd ever disclosed these items when, let's say, interviewing Bernie Sanders or Klobuchar or anything of the sort. You know, by the way, full disclosure, uh, I, I pay her gas bill or something like nothing. But Rona McDaniel's the one with an integrity problem. But it, it, this was all on Meet the Press Sunday, and it was just laughable. And <sighs> Kristen Welker has to come out beforehand and give this little apologetic introduction. Let me just say, I wasn't involved in the hiring of her. Like, don't blame me. While kind of warning the audience, okay, now Republicans coming on, be careful, govern yourselves accordingly. It's like, holy shit, can you just talk to somebody without all of this emotional strain and strife? Well, turns out no, (laughs) because Mm -hmm. the following day on MSNBC, I think literally every single host had to come out with their own therapy session regarding the hiring of Rona McDaniel. Morning Joe. Rachel Maddow, Jen Psaki, Joy Reid, Lawrence O'Donnell. I, I I didn't look at Chris Hayes only because I was on a deadline crunch, but I'm pretty sure he probably had something to say about it. And all of them 
including Nicole Wallace. All of them had these just fits of measure. We were not consulted or we don't approve of this and she will not be appearing and we disavow any of these lies. Nicole Wallace actually said that they don't want her to come on and pollute their sanctified airwaves. <laughs> no, sac- uh, sacred airwaves. That's what she said. Sacred airwaves at MSNBC. It's like, honey, you have Joy Reid on every single night. Don't give me sacred about anything. <laughs> and this is the funniest of all, though. They're all having this collective emotional meltdown on the air, oblivious to how ridiculous and embarrassing they look. Rona McDaniel is not going to appear on MSNBC at all. The network already came out and declared that after she was hired. Oh, it won't be on MSNBC, not coming on here. So every single one of these personalities is just having this conniption fit on camera about something that's not going to take place. It's, 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 I, I gotta say, I've enjoyed it immensely simply because you're watching people that are so vitriolic against her and yet so welcoming to someone who literally worked for the Biden White House. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, Wait a the last person that should come out lecturing about hiring Democrat, or I should say political operatives on the air should be Jen Psaki. And yet yes. there's Jen Psaki. I, I was just like, I, I cannot make this stuff up. This is better than Wag the Dog. I remember that movie coming out and I thought, oh, this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. Oh my God, it's all happened. It has, it has all happened and it's still happening in even more ridiculous ways to this day. I, the very fact that they talk about the, the the sanctified air at MSNBC, we can't pollute that with this other. <laughs> On any given day, you are going to hear MSNBC talking about Donald Trump being a Nazi, how he's going to jail people, how he's going to assassinate his political opponents. He's going to make journalism illegal. He's going to arrest children. Yes, they've said this on the air. If he's elected, they have come up with the most hysterical, outlandish, fever dream level conspiracy theories about Donald Trump getting elected. And now they're just like quivering in a puddle. We might have a Republican come on and say something. (laughs) And here I thought that the whole reason for these opinion journal panelists and, and all that stuff was to get... To not be in an echo chamber, to actually get several different points of view across and let the people watching make up their own minds as to what's going on. That's what I always thought they were supposed to be doing. I mean, they always have their token individual. And I got to give props to things like The Five and and, uh, the new show that that Crystal uh, Plant has over on Newsmax because they're their token is usually far left and he gets to speak a lot. He or she gets to speak a lot. So I, I got to give him props for that. But I don't find that going on in MSNBC or NBC or CNBC or any of the other, you know, no, uh, they, CNN. They, they none they'll of claim it, but it never occurs. Like when Jen Psaki came on, she said, you know, that we're going to be a forum and we want to invite Republicans to come on and give their opinions and talk about things from the Republican vantage. It has never happened. She's never had a Republican on her show. Ted Cruz even had his people take her up on the offer. Like reached out to her show and said, hey, you guys want to have Republicans on? Let me know. I'm, I'm more than willing to come and talk to you guys. Shot down. Nope. <laughs> Yet there she is with John Kerry walking around Washington, D.C., buying ice cream, chuckling and chatting. She went on a bike ride with Raphael Warnock. Oh, I'm yeah, the, I that? remember that. Uh-huh. I, I remember, uh, what's his name? The little short, skinny guy, uh, David Hogg. <laughs> yes. She looked statuesque next to that guy. <laughs> I was like, Ted Saki's not a monster. I've actually, yeah, I've <laughs> met Hogg before. Five. 
Yeah, Hog is not statuesque, and he's rather wispy in nature, I'll say. He's a, he's a very, very, very ethereal individual. <laughs> like, I was, uh, that was at some kind of, I, I think it was an election night that was being held in my area, and I went to it. And it was just, you know, like a, a watch party. Well, in my county, of course, Democrat. And this is right down the road from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas School. So, of course, that was just a flood of those people. And then David Hogg appeared in this, like, excitement washed through. The, oh, David's here. Oh, did you know David Hogg is here? And I'm, you know, I'm sitting at a table with my computer doing some coverage and such. And I just look up and he walked in and I just chuckled. I was like, oh, my God. Really? I, I think he looks even smaller in stature than when he was in high school, but wow. That's that's one thing. But now this 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 whole NBC emotional fervor going on about somebody being hired on the network just is amazing to watch because it, Mika Brzezinski even said, you know, we welcome conservative Republicans to come on and discuss, name one, Mika. Michael Steele, sorry, not conservative. Uh, they've got like two or three, Joe Scarborough, of course, that still try to claim he's Republican. Please. And even if you do want to say this, conservative, no way. I, I defy you to come up with a single conservative voice on MSNBC. Not going to happen. Just doesn't no. exist. I'm so I'm racking my brain through anything. I I can't find one. They might. Oh no, he's a Republican. Oh no, he was a GOP. Sure. Yet here's yeah. Rona McDaniel, who the Republicans were finally saying, "Thank God she's gone." <laughs> who MSNBC should welcome with open arms because of what she did to the Republican Party. Um. And, seriously, when she was, you know, we discussed this during our phone call. When she was reelected as RNC chair, the DNC chair came out and congratulated her for making his job easier. I'm not even kidding. I have the oh, yeah. screenshot. <laughs> I mean, and when I she got reelected, like, oh I don't know God. a single Republican that was happy about it. No, no. I, well, her uncle. That was about it. Well, yeah, but I don't, I don't know her uncle. But I mean, everybody just pretty much oh, all had uh, the same that reaction. That would be Mitt Romney. <laughs> of course, and I say conservative with air quotes. <laughs> well, no, I, I said Republican. I didn't say conservative. Okay, true. No, they, Republican. But seriously, when she got reelected, I I don't know anybody that was like, "Hey, okay, good news, great." No, everybody was like, oh, "Really?" <laughs> yeah, we. Everybody had been pushing for um, I forget her name, obviously, Harmony and some Dillon. of us. Yeah, and 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 some of us were actually pushing for Scott Pressler because he has done so much for um, in, with his canvassing efforts for the Republican Party. He has done a lot, and so we were, you know, pushing his name forward and and saying anybody but Rona. Basically, that's what it came down to. Anybody, the dog catcher, the guy in charge of my mail route, anybody would have been fine. But no, they had to put Rona back in. Yep. So, and and there's MSNBC pretending like it was Joseph Goebbels or something, you know, just yeah. calm down. She's on your side, if anything. But but yeah, you know, which begs the question: Why are they attacking her so much, even though they know that she did a lot to destroy the RNC and? Republican chances in many areas in particular. Uh, it's all it's all performative wailing going on. It wasn't there's no logic behind it. <laughs> she pushed for this and she did that and okay, you know, this basically it's it's outrage at her to set the stage for the upcoming election is all it is. They're liars. They're trying to rig it. They're trying to do this. Uh huh. Okay, sure. Uh, we have on record the Biden administration rigging the election. <laughs> I, mean, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how I 
otherwise I can put it, but it was actually reported on and showed what they did. And everybody was just kind of sitting back with a golf clap. Well, sure. Okay. Yes. That's how it's done. Well done, Joe. Yeah. I mean, this is what, you know, not to bring in another topic, but Rolling Stone had that. Um, <laughs> if the you can call strategy. it, if you can call it a column, you know, and they, you know, they would, they ran with this saying that, you know, for years, Trump had been working to steal the 2024 election and they have an inside look at how the team for Biden has built this superstructure and they put that in quotation marks. And, you know, I, I mean, I'm like, did y'all forget that Time magazine actually came out and said, this is how we stole the 2020 election? Did y'all forget about that? Because we didn't. No, but they want you to. <laughs> it was I like, mean, oh, that wasn't is, supposed to go to print. This is what I don't understand. You have literally an administration that is, well, not specifically the administration, but several governorships and several Democrats are fighting to get Trump off the ballot in certain places, in certain states. You have them trying to put him in jail. You're literally, they have opened up the borders in order to lift up their their vote counts. But it's the GOP that's trying to steal the election. Are you kidding me right now? It's always, and this, and it always goes back to Karl Marx, always accuse the enemy of what you yourself are doing because that causes confusion and then you get away with it. He literally, well, that's in his book. <laughs> but that's the, the dark irony of this whole immigration issue is what, what's playing out here is this is all, this is all being done for representation purposes so that people who are not citizens will be counted and that'll lead to House of Representative representation and such. This is the this is the very thing that Democrats claim to be against because that was the whole three fifths compromise and uh, five eighths compromise, however you want to call it, regarding slavery. That was the whole controversy of that was counting slaves as citizens who didn't have the right to vote. Uh, mm -hmm. Guess what an illegal immigrant is. <laughs> And, but they're going to be pushing for that to be a population count that's valid, defying their own centuries-old position on the matter. Huh. But this is, you know, par for the course. That they, yeah, it, it's just amazing that they are brazen enough to think this goes unnoticed, I guess is where I'm going with this. Yeah, they, they really do think, and, you know, like I was telling you this morning how I was watching uh, the tragedy being covered, the tragedy being the Francis Scott Peak Bridge in Baltimore, um, being um, covered by CNN and how they were reviewing the video from, from uh, the wreck and the way the anchor was talking to the TV was as if you were addressing five-year-olds. And I was like, this is really how they think of their viewership. They are low information voters. They really do think that you, the viewer, you, the people watching these shows don't have a lot between your ears. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, if you watch them closely, they really do think that, that every single time, how many times have they actually put up a screenshot of something somebody said on Twitter and then they tell you they said the exact opposite? Oh, yeah. How often has that happened? I mean, that, I mean that's not almost standard. Well, we saw this in, on Meet the Press. So Kristen Welker had her interview with Rona McDaniel. And we can listen to it. We can hear her speak. The words got accepted in my ears and I absorbed what she had to say. Then they had to convene a four person panel to discuss the interview and tell us what was said and what it all means. And this is when Chuck Todd went through his mental break. 
like we, you can't just let the interview stand for itself. No, let me explain to you what she means when she says, how about she can say what she needs? Why do I need Chuck Todd to tell me what Rona McDaniel was telling me? You know, that's, no. but this is because the, they have to translate in order to, you know, make sure that they uh, get their, uh, the narrative across, I guess. Yeah, it's always the case. They, they just have to lecture us. Let, 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 let me explain to you plebeians what this is actually going on here. <laughs> and even if they say the exact opposite, uh, yeah, I, I heard what she had to say. It's the same thing with the uh, fact checkers. They do this all the time. They'll look at something that's factually accurate and then they'll start importing all these other issues and content that had nothing to do, no bearing on what was spoken, and all of a sudden the 100% accurate quote is half true. Not entirely accurate, misleading. Uh Uh-huh, got it. But this is, this is the press corps anymore, and we saw this get completely exposed this week in the most hilarious, disturbing fashion. Last weekend, everybody was in an uproar about Trump saying bloodbath. Yes. Talking about the economy. Talking about the auto industry. And if I'm not elected, there'll be a bloodbath, not just in the auto industry, but across the country. Economic strife. Bloodbath is an economic term. The press lost their mind. He's calling for violence. He wants this country to be divided. He wants blood in the streets. All this talk. Because he properly used an economic term. It's in the dictionary. That's oh, I remember, I remember when we took economics in high school. That was, you know, we were being taught about the stock market. And this was admittedly back in 83, 84. Um, but one of the things that they did use to teach us was uh, what happened in 81 with gold, 80 and, uh, 79, 80, 81 with gold. And the term on the graph was bloodbath. I remember that exact term because I always thought that that was so cool that they used that term. <laughs> and I was in you know high school when they used this term. So it's standard. Yeah. And yet here they are telling us, nobody ever uses that term for the economy. Uh, You might want to tell Merriam Webster that because it's in the dictionary, third entry, bloodbath, economic strife and hardships that occur. It was so bad that Google went back and removed that part of the definition (laughs) of their own search. (laughs) It's like, oh my God. Google is bailing out the reporters in real time. Now, This is how they got exposed in two ways. One, seven days earlier, when everybody was getting fired at the Republican National Committee, it's a bloodbath. Say these exact same news outlets. Mm -hmm. That was acceptable. But then, late last week, on AC360, this is the show, that's what we call Anderson Cooper's show, by the way. Yes. AC360. He had on... Democrat Party strategist James Carville, that old desiccated husk of a political commentator. Skeletor. I'm going to tell you how the party is going to (laughs) run. The Cajun Skeletor. (laughs) This party got to get going. I'm going to tell you what. He's talking about Joe Biden and what his campaign needs to do and actually says... What Joe Biden has to do is go out there and commit some wet work against Donald Trump. I, when you heard what I did when you told me that that's what he said on the phone, I was like, (gasps) (laughs) he used the term wet work work. in direct reference to Donald Trump. I was just like, oh my God. (laughs) In case anybody's scratching their head, what do you mean? But this is a term for assassinating someone. This is a, a psyops term. This is a spycraft. Okay. Wet work basically means you've got a black ops operation. You're going to go take somebody out. So, yeah. assassin for hire. Carville says this. 
They have to do the wet work. Anderson Cooper even chuckled at him saying that. It's like, wow, that, that sounds like a mob hit. And then Carvel kind of catches himself. He's like, ah, he's like well, you know, it's, a, it's, all, it's a CIA term to take a guy out. <laughs> yeah, we know, James. <laughs> I know exactly what it is. <laughs> That's the problem. We know what it is. In this case, this is not an economic term. No. No, he's directly saying take out a guy. Says, not a single complaint was heard, found, written, seen anywhere in the media. And Carville has been making appearances on the regular. He's always on MSNBC. Now he's on with Anderson Cooper. I mean, they're trotting this guy out, desperate to prop up Joe Biden as much as possible. So it's not like, okay, James, back to retirement. Go back in your hole. We don't need you. No, he's on almost daily anymore. So here he is calling for wet work to be executed against Donald Trump. And eh, everybody's cool with that. Yeah. Oh, that's fine. Because it's d different when they d do it. <laughs> d <laughs> I mean, just it's, it's I, as I, ridiculous as it sounds. Can you imagine had somebody on the right said that term? The, what the left would have been doing by now, they would have been canceled. They went insane with the term niggardly. What do you think they're going to do with the term mm -hmm. wet work? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it's just, it's, it's hypocritical. It's lying is all it is. It's just absolute yes. garbage. And, you know, they've, we, we've got everything on display. Brian Stelter has been out there the last few days too about this Rona McDaniel thing. Oh, and the lies perpetrated oh by them. It's like, dude, Russian He's, collusion, Hunter laptop, 51 names on the intelligence letter. I mean, which lie do you want me to crack out for your esteemed industry? And that, oh, that he Rota's tried. unacceptable. Yeah, and he's trying, well, in my opinion, he's just trying to be relevant at this point. <clears throat> um, but he will never outlive the potato. Sorry. So. Not even 40 years old yet. My God, how, how, how do I look younger than this guy? Oh it's amazing. It's amazing. I think I could be his mother. <laughs> that I, I is can't sad. even wrap my head around that. I mean, seriously, I, 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 I mean, I, I look at him and I'm like, he, he just, I, I don't get it. I don't get it, but whatever. The potato will live on. <laughs> well, we have other things to cover and other news to Indeed. go over. There's uh, quite a bit of amusement coming out of California. Well, <laughs> that, that, I gotta that's, have to that's I gotta you're going to have to narrow that down. Yeah, yeah, a little vague, <laughs> sorry. Um, Marietta Police Department has been trying to deal with, I guess it's a new law or a new mandate that's going on, but when it comes to arresting suspects on various crimes, they no longer have been permitted to post their complete mugshots unless it's a serious crime. I guess murder or felonious assault or something, they would still do it. But otherwise, you know, for minor crimes or such, they won't do it. So the police department has taken on a curious solution to this. They're putting up the mug shots, but they're covering the individual's faces. Yeah. But they're not blurred out. It's not a black spot. Instead, they're superimposing the Lego characters' heads over the face of their suspects that they booked. Yeah. <laughs> now... The effect is comical, I'll give you that. It's funny, it's funny. And I think one of the reasons that uh, they had to go with this was uh, there, some law was passed that you couldn't humiliate the people. It was it was a humiliation or something, I don't know. Yeah, there was as, some of as that. As always, they're protecting the rights of the criminals, not the victims, but. Yeah, and there, some, some were also claiming that it displays somebody who hasn't been convicted in a fashion that makes them appear guilty and the stigma and blah, 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 blah. 
Okay, sure. How about this? The, don't rob a Taco Bell at four in the morning when you're drunk off your ass. I'm just gonna throw. I mean, that that's out. a that's a that's a that's an option. That's a that's a choice. You know, we, you, you I, don't have to be there. I'm not sure why they chose the mini fig heads <laughs> from Lego because, as we all know and we all enjoy, we have the entire emoji board to choose from. They could have mm-hmm. just a smiley face would have been fine. Um, a, a sad face or a frowny face. Any of those emojis would have been fine. Um, but they chose the Lego mini fig heads, and so now Lego is not happy. <laughs> yeah, I had this. Uh, I had the story lined up, and then Lego all of a sudden jumped into the fray. <laughs> and they may be, as they like to say, queering the deal. Like you know, yeah. that phrase. Yeah, I did. nice. <laughs> um, yeah, so the Lego group reached out to Marietta Police Department and respectfully asked them to refrain from using their intellectual property on the social media content of the arrests. So they, uh, they said, we do understand and we're going to comply with it, said the police department. We're exploring other methods to continue publishing our content in a way that's engaging and interesting to our followers. So. A smiley face. There is nothing to, I don't understand what they're exploring for. I mean, if they can't blur the face, put a smiley face sticker on it. <laughs> yeah, but I think, uh, I don't know. I, I, I thought the Lego head was rather inspiring. because I thought, I thought so too. Like I they've got a police funny. lineup and they have different facial expressions on them all too. One's got a beard, one's smiling, one's grimacing. And yes. There's actually another shot of a guy being in, in the course of being arrested. He's like sitting on the ground with his hands up and boom, Lego head. <laughs> it's just <laughs> I find it enjoyable pander to me but no Lego had to step in with their damn lawyers and ruin it they ruined things for everybody even though I'm a fan and I will be a fan till the day I die but whatever <laughs> yeah but uh, other news out of California they've just instituted the $20 minimum wage yep now, here's my question. What happened to the 15 buck minimum wage? Uh, that wasn't good enough. Because no. that, that was like the solution to everything. 15 mm-hmm. bucks, livable wage, everything is going to be fine. Well, All the companies can afford it. Well, you remember when, um, what's her name? Uh, the one out of Cal, uh, the one out of former speaker, Nancy Pelosi. Mm-hmm. Um, she was pointedly asked why not fifty dollars an hour and she didn't have an answer for that it's always been about this living wage but what they don't tell you is that these jobs are not designed to be living wages these are just temporary jobs jobs to get you started in your career wherever you're entry you're level is the term entry level there. thank you, you. Know, this is high school kids this is when you start a job and you're going through the training, when you're just learning the ropes, when you are walking in the front door and have no discernible skills for that job yet, that's what you start at. And the problem is when you jump in and say, hey, okay, $15, $20 minimum wage to start. Well, people that have been there for years and are making less than that also need to get bumped up appropriately. Yep. So let's just say you're, I don't know, McDonald's shift manager or something, and you're making thirteen fifty. Now you're hiring people that are going to start at fifteen bucks. What are you going to get? You know, you're going to say, well, Shafted. for one, I'm not going to get, you know, I'm going to get fifteen bucks an hour, just like the guy that doesn't know how to drop French fries. How does that work? So they can actually abdicate and say. Why do I have to put in 50 hours and all this stuff? Just come in and punch in for 30 hours and get my 15 bucks and everything's good. This is how you screw up the system. So you either scale up all of the salaries and now your shift managers have to make 17, 18 bucks an hour. And all of a sudden now your Big Mac is costing 10, $12. Well, you know, at the last minute, they tried to rectify this wreck of a bill. 
by passing a, yet another bill that exempts certain people from it. <laughs> I just could not believe that this happened. I mean, this was so I was crying shallow and so cynical. So they came up with <laughs> the one set aside. Well, if you bake your own bread on premises, this is going to exempt you from the minimum wage. Well, why would why would baking a loaf do that? Oh, because that would involve Panera bread. Panera. Oh, who happens to be a significant campaign donor to Gavin Newsom. So this has actually lifted a lot of bakeries up out of it, <laughs> uh, admittedly. Um, but it, they must bake and sell bread as a standalone item in order to qualify for this exemption, the bread exception. Um, some The new bill actually has other exemptions added to it. So for the, the exemptions for the $20 fast food minimum wage, um, includes airports, museums, event centers, theme parks, hotels, and gambling establishments. So basically, if you're a standalone McDonald's, you don't qualify. But if your McDonald's is in an airport, you qualify. So I would not be surprised if Wendy's, McDonald's, in and out all of these people started selling buns by themselves as an option to take home because that would qualify them for that exemption because that's a standalone bread item. That is a way to avoid this massive $20, you know, minimum wage hike that you have to institute in all the people. And, you know, like I was telling you, my friend's parents are planning on closing up their little deli shop because they can't afford to pay all of the people that work there $20 an hour. And the people that are there that are happy to take 10, they cannot take 10. It's illegal for them to take $10 an hour. So they're screwed too. Yeah, because that's so going to make the politicians look bad. Yes. So now you have an establishment that was helping people at $10 an hour and, you know, was helping the neighborhood and all that stuff. They're closing up shop and seven people are out of work. And now they have to go and fight for a slot in a place that will pay for $20 an hour, which those slots are very small. They're very minimal. They're they're not, you know, they're they're not a lot of them to go around. And watch for other companies to start putting up kiosks. Well, here's one of the other flaws in this, and then, trust me, there's numerous. But oh, I'm sure. When they're writing <laughs> these laws, it's always about, you know, we're gonna stick it to the corporations. They can afford this. And, you know, they look at McDonald's as a billion dollar company. No, they don't look at it, of course, as individual franchise owners own the McDonald's restaurants and incur the costs. So they think Ray Kroc in his McMansion can pay for these salaries. No, that's not the case. It's the upper middle class business owner that's got to foot this bill. But here's the flaw. And, in, and it's in direct reference to your friend's deli shop. So your friends are put, they got the screws put to them. They can't do this. They have to close up. But guess what? Subway would be exempt because Subway has always made their own bread on premises. Right. So the mom and pop deli now is shutting down and the corporate giant is going to be able to survive because they can pay their people minimum wage. The exact opposite of what they intended for this bill to do. Yeah. Well, for now, they can afford it. Pretty soon, they're going to be like, you know, we're going to have to start uh, thinking about ordering kiosks instead of having people at the cash, you know, at the cashier, you know. And, uh, oh, how about automated um, uh, robot arms to put food together? And it's yeah. coming. So, yeah. fire people and install touchscreens and... There's even some McDonald's right now that have the robotic service windows. Yep, they do. So you'll you'll have somebody maybe hand flipping the burgers, but they'll put it together, put it on a trolley, it then compiles the order, comes into a tray that slides up, the window will open, you grab your food. 
So <laughs> this is how stupid it's getting. And, you know, I'm waiting for, like, AutoZone to put a bread oven in the shop. <laughs> Honestly, yeah, the, I would not be surprised. That battery would be $100, but now it's down to $80 if you buy a loaf of bread. Hey, see how that works? Dude, suck it, Gavin. And Seriously, literally. I would not be surprised if a lot of people started actually selling their own bread standalone and um, to try and avoid this $20 minimum wage hike. It's to their advantage. And you know what? If you have somebody on the premises baking, you don't have to stock the bread all day. You can have 10 loaves for sale in the morning and you qualify. That's it. So you could basically hire out somebody salaried as opposed to minimum wage, you know, hourly to come in, bake 10, 20 loaves of bread in the morning, and that's it. And that's a, that's a way to avoid this this um, boondoggle. Well, look at one person making an extra $10 an hour. 40-hour week, $400, boom, there's your bread oven. Mm-hmm. So go buy your bread and your dough, make a few loaves, and everybody makes 12 bucks an hour. Suck it, Gavin. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, people have to be smart. People, they need to start looking for um, ways, around, ways around this because this is, I, I honestly think California is lost. I don't see it going back to the way it used to be where it was the bread basket and, and, and all that stuff. It's just, it's gone. It's gone. Yeah. And I've, uh, you know, I just saw recently was um, one of the guys over at Red State, his wife posted something where in Los Angeles, they have three politicians that are running that want to go hyper left wing. Like Los Angeles isn't left wing enough for them. They have to go even further with some of their policies. I, mean, <laughs> I know. Like what, what is going on in LA that's complete, that you're a leftist and going, you know what, this isn't enough. <laughs> I, I don't get it. I really don't get it because even, you know, from some reports that I've seen on Telemundo, Univision, on the Spanish networks, there, you know, sometimes even the, the illegal immigrants that live in those cities have issues with some of the stuff that the left is pushing. They're like, this makes no sense. This isn't what we came here for. Admittedly, they came here for the free benefits, but there's some stuff that even they have issues with. <laughs> so it makes you wonder. And you know, try to rent a U-Haul truck in California. It's going to cost you about yeah, six, seven thousand dollars Yeah, it's it's extremely cost prohibitive because <laughs> everybody's jumping ship and yeah that's why my my friend she wants her parents to move and she's making arrangements to actually buy a truck to take over there to facilitate the movie because it's that bad they can't rent a u-haul truck they can't rent any kind of moving truck pods I don't know what the going rate for pods is, <laughs> but I think she was telling me that it's cheaper for her to book pods in Pennsylvania, take it out there, fill it up, and bring it back than it is to just, you know, go from California to Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that cannot be true. She's like, I don't know. That's what I've been hearing. And I'm like, oh, good God. It's ridiculous. California is actively trying to keep you on a plantation. They need to keep the people there. <laughs> they're sucking you dry, but they're not letting you leave. Not without punishment. Well, they even, they, they were getting desperate a few years ago. There's no way this is going to stand. But they were going to try to impose taxes on people after they leave the state. Yes. <laughs> I believe there was a, a big millionaire that left and decided to... He ended up having to give up his American citizenship and become uh, return to Singapore because of the taxation was so bad. And California went after him 
And he's like, you don't understand. I'm no longer a citizen. And California was trying really, really hard, but you made your money here. I said, I made my money as an American citizen. I gave up my citizenship because taxation was so bad. I no longer owe any taxes. I paid my taxes while I lived in California. So long, sayonara. They really tried to get him on it and they couldn't. But they're now trying to pass a law whereby, I don't know if they passed it or they tried to pass it, but I believe they wanted to get taxes on people's retirement for if they left for the next 10 years. 10 years after you were still paying taxes for 10 years after you left California. And I'm like, that's insane. Not even the Germans do this. And the Germans are Nazis, pardon the pun, on when it comes to taxation. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, you know, this is a state that is in severe debt. And nobody that's running the show can actually put together why that's the case. Oh, it's a big mystery to me. I mean, they drove Toyota out of the state. They drove Did Tesla out. They drove SpaceX out. They drove everybody out. Dell, Dell's, Dell was one of the first ones to leave. <laughs> they've made Austin what it is today. I mean, they own half of Austin now. It's just amazing to me that, I mean, at some point in time, is common sense ever going to leach in? You know, this is costing us a shit ton. Nope. No, no. They, their, their response is to tax the people more because they know that California needs to survive. Forget people needing to survive. California needs to survive, so you will do it for the state. I, I just have to sit back and laugh. That's all. It's just, wow, okay. You guys, you guys keep going. But I think one of the ideas is you can maybe change terminology, and that should fix everything. I have a prime example of that for you. <laughs> There's uh, over at Newsweek. <laughs> Love this story so, so much. Uh, they have one of their investigative reporters by the name of Valerie Bauman. Don't you dare call her a slut. <laughs> She's going to come out and say that now in her defense. <laughs> Um, okay. Valerie has spent four years on an investigative piece. Much of it centered on the fact that she wanted to be a single mother. She wasn't in a relationship, but she wanted a child, and so she was exploring options. And uh, started to discover that there's like a subculture in the country of women who can actually become impregnated outside of the confines of a relationship or even using clinics and other medical facilities. <laughs> As she describes it, uh, single women and LGBT couples are increasingly pursuing pregnancy via known donors, people they find on the internet, Facebook groups, even dating apps, things of this nature. She calls this off-the-grid <laughs> insemination. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm losing it. <laughs> and these are people practicing, you know, get, finding different ways to start a family using the unregulated sperm market, as she describes it. Unregulated? Oh, my God. <laughs> This is uh, Bordello. <laughs> yeah, and this is also um, <laughs> basically <laughs> she says when you are seeking out one of your, these male partners, you're engaging in freelance sperm donations. Freelance sperm donations. Back in the day, they used to um, call this whoring around. I, you know, <laughs> I just. Oh my God. <laughs> but no, we are now practicing off the grid insemination. As she describes it, this completely undermines all of her attempts at going with the euphemism 
and and such. She says, um, women's dreams can come true because many find decent men who will get them pregnant for little to no cost. It's also a place where men can go for easy sex. You don't say. Men are using the internet to get laid on the on the cheap and easy. Ashley never, Madison. That was never the happened before. This is this is all news to us. Thank you. For this. So this is kind of like a take, a cheap take on Ashley Madison. <laughs> right? And this is what this is. <laughs> Freelance sperm donations. Uh-huh. <laughs> Does that mean you're sleeping around? Just say it. You're sleeping around. Just embrace it for what it is. This this is where we're at, though. <laughs> we have to applaud these efforts. I swear sometimes. So what do you got on your plate over there? Anything fascinating and uh, grabbing your attention? Oh, I was, you know, I live for irony. My, my... I, I gave my daily supplement and of course I, I got my daily supplement from Dan rather um, this, uh, <laughs> this time. I, you know, to this, I still don't understand how this man is still relevant. I don't understand. He and Brian Williams too. Both of them. I don't understand why they still have gigs. I really don't. But that is a testament to how media has fallen and how media itself is no longer media it's propaganda it's it's narrative driven not fact driven but you know I, I i was just dan rather was like this is circling back thank you jen Saki, for that term uh to rona mcdaniel and basically he's bitching about the fact that nbc has given her a platform because it legitimizes what she has said in the past. And I'm going, did, th does this man not have mirrors in his house at all? This is the same guy who was busted for a fake news story about a freaking memo while he was trying to besmirch a sitting president. <laughs> it is. <laughs> But that's the thing is he is <laughs> he's complaining about her lies. Dan Rather is. Yes. And you know, at, at any point in time are people going to I mean, I think the guy has kind of been laughed off. He like they I think they still have some journalism awards named after him and crap like that. But um, yeah, he's he's really not of any regard. I mean, he's a name. That's all he is. He's not active. He's not doing things. But I, what I found amusing too was in response to this uproar, he was basically condemning MSNBC for hiring her and then encouraging people to partake of independent journalism because that's where the real honesty is taking place. So in an attempt for NBC to like structure their... Republican bona fides or whatever it is that he called it. He now says you need to be more independent, but I'm like, that's because no one will have you. <laughs> you're in, you're literally living that yeah. life because no one will have you. You're and independent, not by choice. <laughs> and, and the thing is, everybody is like really head up about Ronna McDaniel. And I don't, I, I honestly don't see why the vitriol, because you would think that as hated as she is on the right, that the left would embrace her. But the, the, but this is just goes to show you, it doesn't matter how much you hate the right, the left is never going to embrace you once you've had the C next to your name or the R. I mean, look what happened to Max Boot. He decides, you know what, I'm no longer a Republican from now on, I'm a Democrat. The Democrats still hate him. He yeah. has no respect from either side. And I'm like, that there's there's no big tent on the left. There is no big no. tent on the left. And so, you know, he, he's going on about that, you know, she was a Trump loyalist. Oh, yeah, that's why she screwed every single Trump pick. Yeah, okay, I get it. Sure, she was a loyalist. Um, 
she's related to Mitt Romney. I mean, <laughs> I don't know where they got this. She's a Trump loyalist from. I never considered her that. As a matter of fact, I had issues with Trump actually supporting her because it made no sense to me, none whatsoever. But, you know, I, I don't pretend to know what's going on in Trump's head. Although I got to give him props, though. He is a master troller. Trump, uh, you know, Truth Social sure. went public and the, um, the uh, sign for it on uh, at the at the NYSE, I think it's uh, DJT. <laughs> I got to say, this man can troll the, with the best of them. I got to give him props for that. He's not my favorite person on the planet, but he can troll with the best of them. I got to give him. <laughs> so, you know, th- th- to me, that was the irony was so rich in that post that he did over on Twitter over the whole Ronald McDaniel thing that I was just like, yeah, I'm done for today with my irony, you know? And of course I can't ignore that. The, the, the whole issue with, it's not just Ronald McDaniel, it's the entire left. They've gone so insane over Trump that it is just to them. It's martyrdom. It really is. It has become martyrdom for them. And I mean, look at the, the uh, hearings that were going on and how Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez went absolutely bad shit. I just can't with that chick. <laughs> I don't think anybody can. I, first, okay. Including her boyfriend. He's got to be one heavily medicated individual. He has no, he has no balls. He's a eunuch. I'm pretty sure he's a eunuch. Anyway, but I mean... I I hate the concept of hearings because, you know, when you're watching a hearing on C-SPAN, all of those people, you know, the senators and the congressmen are up high and the person testifying is down below, you know, seated at this table with this tiny little microphone, you know, and he's made to feel very small, very insignificant. And it's it's almost star chamber like. I mean, it's really weird. I've never actually liked hearings for that reason. Because it's mostly a power trip, really, for the people sitting up there. But it's also a misnomer. You think it's a hearing, but they're not there to hear you. They're, here, they're there to hear themselves grill you. That's it. Yeah. Your, your, you know, your responses matter absolutely nothing. And so she was exemplary in, in that role last week when... She went after that poor guy uh, about the whole Rico thing. You know, what crime, what single crime did Biden commit? What crime? And I'm like, oh, God, that. that, She actually said, she says Rico is not a crime. And she, yeah, she says Rico is not a crime. And I'm like, okay, Donald Trump's off the hook. (laughs) That's all I got to say. Yeah, I I mean. (laughs) Technically, she was almost accurate because Rico is actually a collection of crimes, not a crime. So she might have a little bit of an escape route there. But this this is what's so amazing is that she gets held up as this expert, you know, like she's a vaunted voice. And (laughs) she just... Absolutely gets humiliated because she dared to even engage with Ted Cruz. And she is so self-centered in believing that she knows everything, as well as everybody hates Ted Cruz. So I'm perfectly right here going against a guy who is a full-blown lawyer who has tried cases in front of the Supreme Court, i.e. knows what the hell he's talking about. And he... In like one sentence is able to undress her completely and be factually accurate and completely unimpeachable what he does. And she's oblivious to this. Like, uh, there he goes again. And, you know, then everybody jumps to her defense because the mean Ted Cruz used facts, something of that Uh, nature. Yeah. And and I'm like, uh, there was this one guy, he's actually left of center and everything. And he actually replied to her. It's like, you know, 
I'm a big supporter of all of your stances and all that stuff, but I got to go with the guy I detest here because <laughs> I'm a lawyer too. And that's his, that's his bailiwick, bailiwick. And so I, I got to go with what he's saying because he's actually on the right here. And he got, he got this avalanche of absolute loathing that he ended up deleting his tweet. Um, <laughs> I was like, damn it, I should have taken a screenshot. But here was some guy on the left saying, the law matters. You know, and th this is one of the reasons I really enjoy Jonathan Turley. He is a liberal, but he's like, the law matters. You know, you have, you go by the letter of the law. This is important. <laughs> um, the, I know that a lot of people were upset with Chip Roy when he voted to not uh, go after uh Mallorca's that time, but he had a good point. He said, if we do the same thing that they did, then the law has no purpose. We need to abide by the letter of the law, which is why they had to go and make sure that they followed the letter of the law when, um, when uh, going to impeach Mallorca's. So, um, in this case, you know, she's like, she's, she's losing her mind and she's like trying to correct a man, a, a former solicitor general of the state of Texas who argued successfully at the Supreme Court and won the majority of the time. This, this guy, that's who she's going after. And I'm yeah. like, uh, you don't know who you're dangling with. Let me tell you how it is, Mr. Ted Cruz. <laughs> and it's, the, the problem with her is, as, you know, Ronald Reagan used to say, it's not that, you know, it's, it's that they don't know. They don't know that they don't know. The left yeah. doesn't know that they don't know. And she is the last person of that group of people uh, in, in Congress to have any sort of humility whatsoever. She cannot be wrong. She is full of pride. Yeah. And for her, this is a, a power trip. Well, it's also the fact that she's completely incurious yeah. about the very things that she's talking about. So it, there are so many times where she spouts off on a topic and you're just looking and saying, oh, no, no, honey, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Go explore and research. This is something I see in the press all the time. This is this is why I'm I'm very sure. I know that her reading material does not include any mystery, any suspense. It does include <laughs> horror, yeah. possibly romance, mostly drama. But um, yeah, absolutely no mysteries, none, because she is not inquisitive. She will not go look. She will not research. She doesn't do any of that. I re do you remember when she first? When she was, I think her first year as a congressperson, she challenged Ted Cruz to something. I forget what it was. And Ted Cruz was like, you know what? We should get together. We should talk about this. This is this is viable. We should actually think about writing up a, you know, a bill about this particular thing, blah, 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 blah. Guess what happened? She never got back to him. Of course not. And it was, and, and the fact was, Ted Cruz was willing to hear her side and was willing to be bipartisan on a bill because he felt this was important to, to, to everybody. You know, I even for, I forgot what it was. I think it had something to do with, um, um, you know, getting rich in Congress or whatever it was, you know, how, they take advantage of what they know and who they know, and then they make money, you know, I mean, they all do it. Um, but um, he felt that that was, that was a good idea. And he said, I would love to get together. Let's start crafting a bill about this because this is concerning. She never got back to him. She just wanted to put him in a spot where he would have to like fight back against her and then she could use it as a gotcha. That's what it was. She was never serious about it. If you look at all of the bills that she's attached to and everything that she's done, it is fluff. Oh, I'm not even going to say it's fluff because fluff at least tastes good. It's, it's, 
it's like dandelion seeds. That's it. There is no substance whatsoever. And all it did was create more havoc in the lawn that we call capital. So it she's she has really no substance, but she screeches well enough and she harks well enough that she gets the narrative put across. And that's why they need her there. That's why she was necessary. The I mean the guy that she beat was solid. He was he actually did a lot for his uh, district. Then there are a lot of people. My cousin is not in Alexandra Ocasio's Cortez's district, but she has friends that are in that district. And a lot of them have complained about what she did with Amazon, you know, taking oh, yeah. the Amazon jobs away. She chased and, them out of the city because, I, for whatever, some kind of reasoning. I, I don't know what it was, but it was 25,000 jobs, 25,000 yeah. jobs gone. And these people are desperate. I mean, <laughs> you live in New York, you're always desperate for a good job. I mean, the living there is just astronomical. But, you know, and she doesn't, she has two residences out of necessity, but I seldom see her in the New York one. She's always down in D.C. Well, uh, her... Her Tesla doesn't hold a charge long enough to get up there. No, I guess not. That's the issue. She's, <laughs> but, you know, and with the way she was screaming at this guy, I was just like, girl, you are not doing women any favors, specifically Hispanic ones, because you are living the stereotype. You are living the stereotype, and that does not look good. And I wasn't the only one to catch that, because apparently my mom was complaining about it, too. And the thing is, she actually likes Alexandria. She thinks Alexandria is a good role model for girls, Hispanic girls, even though my mom is right wing. But when she saw her attack this guy, oh, she changed her mind. But she changed her mind not because she was attacking this guy, but because she was screeching like a harpy and not letting this guy talk, and it made women look bad. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, the thing is, too, she... Of course, unintentionally does think like when she was doing her old Rico thing, you know, she's talking to Bobolinsky on on the panel and she's yes. like, well, Rico is not a crime. And then she says, you know, where's the victim? OK. Thank you, Alex, because that perfectly applies to the Donald Trump case in New York City right now. Yeah. The financial I mean fraud case that they're bringing against him, despite the fact that. What he's charged with, inflating his values to get a loan from a bank. The bank's not complaining. The bank got paid back in full with interest. The bank was happy to do business with him after this. Where's the crime? Why are they prosecuting him over this? And they this came is... up with this bizarre $500 million mm -hmm. bond that he had to pay. What'd they say? It was um, Bernie Madoff yes. who actually stole from hundreds of people to the tunes of tens of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Actual victims, actual criminal behavior taking place. His bond was $10 million. This Donald is, Trump, 496 or something like that. I mean, it, it's it, pure this is political. Completely, exactly. Exactly. I mean, this is, he borrowed money. Trump borrowed money. He paid it back. And he was handed a above 400 million dollar fine. I think it was 450, closer to 500, if I recall. Now it's been bumped down to 175 million, which is still excessive. But, but in the, in even cases the like banks, this, yeah, even the banks are saying this should not be happening. Even the people whole purpose that of this don't bond like in him. the first place, it's essentially when these are levied, it's to be held in escrow on behalf of the victim so that the payouts right. would then later get held. There's nobody getting paid out from this. There's no, no victim and, receiving this. So and, why and, is this? Like you said, this is to try and break Trump. You have people questioning this, saying maybe we shouldn't do any business in New York City. And you have Kathy Hochul go, coming out. Oh, no, no, no. This will not apply to you, which basically she gave <laughs> the game away. 
she gave the game away by saying this will not apply to anybody else. This oh, is I mean, literally, look. they say this is a special case. And I'm like, he didn't commit a crime. Everybody does this. This is how but business There's is another done. case out there that they found where Letitia James has somebody that did commit a crime to the tune of I don't know, 100 mil or something. They're not pursuing them. They're not holding them. They're not levying these fines and holdings against them. You have a defined crime. You have defined victims, and she's not doing it. And with Trump, she is. I mean, it's so this pathetic. Is, this is the same city where this guy, uh, this, uh, he literally shot a police officer in the face and killed him yesterday. And he had a rap sheet that mm -hmm. was as long as my arm. 21 violent crimes released each time. This is in New York City, but you're going after Trump. You're going after Trump, who literally, the banks are saying he committed no crime. We're good. As a matter of fact, he paid it back with interest. We're happy. Yeah. And they're going after Trump. But, but, but they would let this guy go. And now you have an issue because New York police has been hemorrhaging a lot of um, officers. Uh, the fire department is now, there are, a lot of, um, there are a lot of people in the fire departments that are rethinking uh, their position of working uh, for the uh, New York fire department. There are a lot of issues that the city has. The fact that they're targeting one guy that doesn't even live there anymore, that's a reflection on how political this has become. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a tiered system we're dealing with. But it's, to point that out makes you MAGA. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's what and I'm finding a, out. Uh, yeah, it, it, pointing out facts. I'm, 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 I have been accused of being MAGA so many times that I, I just like... Where do you see that on my, on my, on my timeline? And they're like, "Well, your your attitude and your and your what you're writing here makes you MAGA." I'm like, I'm literally discussing the differences between putting a tomato vine on the ground and hanging it. <laughs> I, I don't, you yeah. know, some people just get really upset about certain things, and yeah, that actually happened on a Facebook post, believe it or not, but. I find that I usually get accused of being MAGA when it's a topic or subject like you just said, where Trump isn't involved. Yeah. Somehow. Oh, you MAGA people. It's like, wait, what? I was talking about something going on in Florida. What you, huh? <laughs> and it, it's, that's just uh, cracks me up. It just cracks me up. Kind of like a scathing report that showed up at CNN with Jake Tapper. <sighs> <laughs> Jake Tapper's going to bring down Aaron Rodgers. Once and for all, it's going to happen. Because Aaron Rodgers is apparently a Sandy Hook denier, if I'm reading this correctly. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know where that came from, honestly. So a 15-year-old story has now CNN breaking it based on comments heard 11 years ago, alleging Aaron Rodgers denied that Sandy Hook took place and was actually an inside job from the feds. This is based on one CNN reporter and has been corroborated by an anonymous source that overheard Rogers saying this at the Kentucky Derby 11 years ago. Unbelievable. No, this no, is a story. I take it back, it's totally believable. And <laughs> if you're sitting there wondering what in the living hell, why the hell, what the hell, it's because <laughs> Robert Kennedy Jr. has hinted that he's got a short list for vice presidential running mates, and Aaron Rodgers might be on that list. So we have to do everything we can to tear down this guy. 
because Robert Kennedy poses a direct and significant threat to Joe Biden. <laughs> Therefore, they got to try to poison the well as much as possible. Therefore, some bullshit claim made over a decade ago about Aaron Rodgers has to get trotted out by Jake Tapper. Now, this gets undermined about four different ways. <laughs> First off is the CNN reporter who claims to have never said anything about this prior until now, until like a day after Aaron Rodgers' name popped up as a vice presidential candidate. <laughs> Somehow. of Oh, yeah, I, I heard him say something once. It's really unsettling. Was, was it unsettling 10 years ago? Okay. No, not apparently not. Got it. Now, Aaron Rodgers came out and addressed this specifically and said, it was a tragedy. I've never questioned it. It took place. I'm on the record saying it took place. And by on the record, there's actually a video interview he conducted about 2012 where he's on tape and on saying Yes, this happened, this shooting took place, and it's a tragedy, and I feel bad for the family, yada, yada. He even wore a sticker on his helmet commemorating the shooting. And yet, there's Jake Tapper with this expose. So, Rogers comes out and says this. He puts out a post. And Jake Tapper, the next day, covered this again and had the post on screen where Aaron Rodgers says, I've always believed the shooting took place, and says, Aaron Rodgers refuses to refute the accusation. Jake, I can uh, read. Everybody <laughs> can over read. Your shoulder. Turn around. <laughs> I mean, damn. Just, I don't, I don't understand anymore how I'm trying. It's tough for me to put it into words because I cover this all the time and I see this all the time. And yet, at the same time, you know, it, again, it's me being cursed with pragmatism, but it's you would think as a you know because I always consider when somebody's on TV and they're a reporter or such that they're a journalist and they behave like a journalist and they look into things as a journalist, meaning basically they just read stuff. That, that's about the high bar for me. Do some research. Look into it. How do you post his comment and then say he never addressed it? I don't get it. I think it's almost as if, again, speaking to the low information voters, most people will not read what's up there and just pay attention to what he's saying. So he he gets the cover of having posted it up there, you know, speaking about it, but then reiterating his actual narrative unto the people who are watching the show. And again, it goes back to that the way they treat their audience says a lot about their audience. It, this, it was a prime example of don't believe your lying eyes. Yes. There's no other way to really describe it because he puts the Aaron Rodgers comment disputing the claim on screen it, it, there it is i can see it and he's uh, he never addressed this he's he has yet to deny this holy son of a bitch i mean that, talk about married to a narrative this was a prime example of it and it's jake taffer of all people i mean i really used to respect the guy you know i Maybe didn't hold him in esteem or anything, but it's like, you know what? He's actually kind of sane. He's, uh, he's got a balanced view of things. He approaches things in a sensible fashion. Nope. He's, he used to be so sensible. And then Trump happened. And now he, I mean, it, it was incredible to watch. Because, I mean... A lot of a lot of people on the right actually respected him because he was pretty fair. You know, a admittedly, he was working for CNN. We had to take a lot with a grain of salt or whatever. But he still was he he tried to be a journalist. He did try to present both sides. And for the most part, he actually did well. And um, I mean, he's a big Peanuts fan. I, I, I love that about him and everything. But then Trump happened. And 
when Trump became president, Jake actually descended into this maelstrom of brokenness. I don't know how else to describe it. He just completely, he, he was broken by this. And it's still affecting him to this day. I don't know if it just shined, if it shone a light into his true character or if it broke his true character and now he just can't recover from it. I'm not sure which is which, but. Yeah, now I'm, I'm going to go with him doing a break of some sort because, you know, it wasn't, I, I guess the thing that stood out was he didn't have a blatant partisanship at the time. So it was like, okay, you know, you, if Jake said it, I might be willing to loosen. But now it's like everything. Yeah, literally Donald Trump just put him on a completely different axis. He's just shifted. He's gone. He's over there now. <laughs> and it's not like all anti-GOP with him, but every story has to be a pro. Like, well, how does this affect Trump? Okay, this is what direction we're going now. And so... Aaron Rodgers pops on the scene and this could help out with Kennedy, which could take votes away from Biden, which could lead to Trump. We hate Aaron Rodgers. And this, there you go. Oh, yeah. It, it's, it, and, and to me, it's like, if you honestly think that RFK Jr. has no shot and you don't think that Aaron Rodgers has the... the Shall I, shall I say gravitas to be vice presidential material? Why does this matter? Well, and then the only reason I can think of is the one that you pointed out. They see RFK as a threat to, you know, Biden taking away Biden votes. Right. But this, yeah, and, and it shows you the emotional level they're at in operating. Because when, when he first broke this story, my very first reaction was, holy shit, this is stupid. Jake, you don't got it. Okay. No. It was... Granted, yeah, somebody at CNN is backing it up, but you got an anonymous source on a stupid story that's over a decade old. Like, no, this is dumb. No. And then the facts started to come in. And then we found the video of him from 10 years ago actually stating the opposite. And it just became worse. And yet there's Jake Tapper digging in. It's, yeah, you're gone, son. At that point, it's just because again, this is me saying just journalistically. When the story first broke, it was like, "Oh, dude, no, don't, don't do this, Jake. That's you don't have it. Don't." And then the facts all came in. I was like, "Oh, brother." <laughs> it was. I was just like, but you'll notice they they didn't backtrack. They didn't apologize. Nothing. None of that happened. They're still pushing. They're still pushing the old agenda. It's th this is where you know I fall into that amazement side of things. Not that I'm shocked this took place, but it's like you're <laughs> the most basic of journalism would tell you there's nothing there, and yet this is the esteemed CNN and the respected Jake Tapper delivering this bullshit story. I expected this from Vice. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I did. I, I thought maybe Vice, maybe, you know. Daily Beast. Mediate, um, somebody, but not. Rolling Stone, but with bigger headlines. <laughs> uh, and it would be, you know, everybody would get a chuckle. It was like, oh, aren't you cute? Try to journalism this. Okay, that's all right. But now it's Jake Tapper. You're like, oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it. Which begs the question, I was like, are you competing with Rolling Stone and Vice? Is that what this is? <laughs> yes, exactly. It's because that, this it's does that not make it. No, this makes CNN look even worse. And, <laughs> and, and I think it also falls back to the that whole mantra that's been going on late that CNN has become right wing. And maybe Jake is just trying to make sure to still captivate the same old audience for fear that they might be leaving w because of the new uh, uh, the new CEO, I guess. But it just it makes 
absolutely no sense. You're literally posting his words up there for people to read, and then you say the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. And I, I, because I honestly think he doesn't expect his viewership to read. It's a. Uh... It's something to behold, that's for sure. But uh, I'm going to continue beholding it. Because it's delicious. <laughs> I, I just can't stop. I can't stop. Can't stop, won't stop. Oh, my goodness. <clears throat> well, we probably should wrap here. We're looking like we're up against the hour. Uh, hour and almost hour and a half. Yeah. Well, I mean, top of the hour. Top of the hour, yes. <laughs> Try to be professional. Yes, and, and you have been. You have been. Imagine my surprise. Yeah, I was I was pretty shocked too. So, Brad, <laughs> why don't you tell us where we can find you? <laughs> well, I'm playing my trade daily over at townhall.com. I've got my media column there entitled Rift from the Headlines, where I uh, expose, delve into, and eviscerate the media on a daily basis. Also on a regular appearances over at redstate.com. And I've got a twice weekly podcast there called Liable Sources, expounding even further on the mayhem in the media complex. You could also hear more of me on this very network. So Thursday night, I will be here with Paul Young from ScreenRant.com. He and I are going to delve into the dark side of Hollywood and bad movies with Disasters in the making. We might have a kaiju feature. <gasps> touch them. Working on that. Working on oh, it. Okay. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> also, uh, alternate Thursdays, I'm here with Ordy Packard as he and I will guide you through all the important entertainment information on the culture shift. And of course, every Tuesday with yourself at eight and a half here on the cocktail lounge. And if you need more of me than that, let's face it, you do. If you head over to Jitter, you can see me flying around as Martini Shark. And what about you, Aggie? How can people find more of your magnificence? Well, you can find me at Aggie Regan and at Aggie the Barkeep over on X. You can find me 8.30 p.m. Eastern, Tuesday nights doing the, co the cocktail lounge with the ever suave you. Uh, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Friday nights doing He Said, She Said with our esteemed producer, Rick. Uh, once a month, Wednesdays, the last Wednesday of every month, we do Toxic Masculinity at 8 p.m. Eastern where the guys, G, Rick, Ordy, and Andrew get together to discuss guy-oriented stuff. We host the Babe of the Month and I bring the drinks. And Jeff and I have recently launched, not so recently, it's been a couple of months, for um, our new it's podcast, new it's newish. Our new book podcast, um, Spirited Books, uh, where we, you know, talk about the latest books that we've been reading, and uh, it they cover all the genres, um, and it's a lot of fun. We always match a tipple to the book that we're reading, so that has been a lot of fun. And that's on the second Monday of every month at 8 30 p.m eastern this month though it's going to be on the third month because the second month happens to be the day of the eclipse and i'm going to be too busy so indeed yes and uh that's about it thank you everyone for joining us this evening and we hope you have a really good one and then go raise a glass and look at the ceiling